morning. I'm frantically cre recreating the sticky note that I forgot in my office that has all the announcements on it. Okay, uh, greeters, good morning. Nice to see you all this morning. Uh, there are a few announcements up here, but I have a few more to share before we uh, begin in fullness. Uh, I want to let you know that Patrick Brown uh, who we uh, sent a beautiful card to. I'm looking for Linda, where's Linda? Linda Matthews made the most beautiful card for Patrick, which many of you uh, signed last week. It was delivered to Patrick in the, in the hospital, and uh, it obviously did him a really lot of good because he came home from hospital this week. So that's the good news. Uh, he is uh, weak and weary, and uh, uh, Linda is uh, not uh, feeling so well in these days. She's got a bit of a cold, and so we need to continue our prayers for the two of them. And then I said to Patrick, we'll see you at church before uh, long, we hope. So that's, uh, you know, in the family news category. Carrying on in the family news category, uh, Eunice turned 90 yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> and Owen turned 21. <laughs> Happy birthday to you both and to anyone else who might be major, major milestones. Owen said that uh, he can now vote in the U.S. election if he so chooses, and I said, Please don't go down there, just, you know, don't leave us <laughs> for that reason. Okay, um, also wanted to uh, just let you know that we are looking for somebody who might organize greeters on Sunday mornings. So uh, the job is not as onerous as it was at one time because the new, in the new system, those of you who are greeters try and find other people to greet and sign up, sign up, right? So we're really looking for somebody who might keep track of, uh, of the weeks and the folks that are signed up and when there's weeks that people haven't signed up and to do a little prompting uh, each week to kind of phone or to email and let people know that uh, we need them to, uh, it's their week to show up. That's what we need someone to do. So please let me know or let Carla know uh, after the service if that's something that you have time to do. There may have been other things written on my um, little sticky note. If there were, I don't know what they are. I want to say uh, welcome back to Sean, who's here again this summer, uh, filling in for us this week. And I really want to extend a word of welcome to two dear friends of mine who are here this morning, <laughs> Eric Hamlin and Todd Irvine. Eric and Todd were part of the group that walked the Camino with me. So I already overheard Roger pumping them for information about me. <laughs> and Eric is like pretending like they've got lots of goods to share. 
oh, it's all love. It's all love. Eric is also uh, on the ministry team at Lynn Valley United Church, and so he's about to return to work after a sabbatical. And uh, so we send our love back to our neighbors at Lynn Valley United with you. Okay, that's all I have. Are there any other announcements for the good of the church? Barb. What about John? Did John come home this week? Okay, so John Andrzejczyk is our, our assistant thrift shop manager. Carla will have, make an announcement about him. Right. <laughs> it's not this microphone. Um, a meal train for John. Um, and so I will be sending an email out to the thrift shop volunteers to, so they can shi- sign up for a meal train um, kind of three days a week for him for a little while. And I'll, I'll make sure that the information and the link uh, goes into the, um, the church newsletter as well. And, uh, or you can contact me directly if you want to get a copy of that, the, the meal train link. I suddenly have another announcement to make because someone has arrived. Or Julie, where did you go? So uh, lots of you know that uh, Carla is about to go on sabbatical. So next Sunday will be her last Sunday with us for a good long stretch of time. She's going to have a month of holidays. And look, you should see the smile on her face if you can't, you know, She's got her back to you, but her, like, the smile is, like, from here to here. So uh, then she will be on a sabbatical from September through until the end of November. And during that time, we have somebody to come uh, to be with us who will be with us a half time. And we will tell you more about that at the end of August. But today, she's actually here with us. So uh, this is the Reverend Julie Lebrun. Yay! Julie is a relatively newly retired minister. She served the folks of uh, uh, currently what's called Inlet United Church in Port Moody. And uh, she's a good friend. She's an awesome human being. And I feel uh, that we will be really blessed by her presence in our midst. So please be nice to her because she has not yet signed on the dotted line. So, you know, pretend that this is a good place to be until we get that taken care of, please. Okay, that's it. Let's begin in earnest. The welcome that we extend at Mount Seymour United Church is as broad and as deep as we can make it. And so you are welcome here, whether this is your very first time joining us, or you're joining us online, or this is the place that you call home. You're welcome here no matter how old or young you are, wherever you are on life's journey. You're welcome here whatever your marital status, your sexual orientation, your gender identity or expression. You're welcome here whatever your financial background is, your ethnic or cultural heritage. You're welcome here if you consider yourself to be a Christian, or part of another faith tradition, where you're someone who seeks to explore the mysteries of life and serve the ideals of compassion and justice and peace. And as a people who seek peace and reconciliation, each time we gather in this place, we remember that we are on the unceded and ancestral territory of the Coast Salish people, in particular the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh nations. We pray that God will guide us in ways of right relationship with Indigenous neighbours here in our community and in our country. There are uh, many, many heroes of the Christian faith people that uh, we know, we know their stories, we hear them over and over again in the cycle of the church year. But there are also many, many characters in the Bible that are lesser known to us. And this summer, we are taking a deeper dive into the lives of some of those people that we don't know so much about. 
some of whom are kind of ordinary folks like you and me, who in some way, sometimes big and sometimes small, have changed the world around them. So today, we are going to meet three characters, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And we are going to witness the way that they prioritize their life of faith above all else. As we journey with these various characters this summer, we are reminded that we are all called to participate in God's redemptive and healing and gracious work in the world. We are all the face of God. As we pray together this morning, you might want to uh, keep your eyes open and have a look around the world room as I say these words. Holy One, as we look around and we see the faces of those we know and love, neighbors and friends, sisters and brothers, we see a community of kindred hearts. As we look around and see the faces of those we hardly know, strangers and visitors, forgotten friends, we see also those who might need an outstretched hand. Creator God, we look around and see all the faces of faith assembled here. In each one of us, your spirit shines through for all to see. Help us to be your face, the face of love in our world, and help us to see your face in one another. Amen.
One of the ways that we know and name this mysterious presence that we call God in this place is through the presence of what we name as the living Christ. We believe that presence is deep within each one of us and between us and all among us. It's a reconciling, a forgiving, a transformative, and a healing presence. And so I invite you now to turn to those around you and with a bow, a handshake, a hug, if you have permission, to share the peace of Christ that is with us. Amen. Whether you take what is written in the Bible as fact, metaphor, myth, or story, listen to these words now for the meaning they hold for you on this day. Reading from the book of Daniel, chapter 3. King Nebuchadnezzar made a golden statue whose height was 60 cubits, cubits and whose width was six cubits. He set it up on the plain of Jura in the province of Babylon. Then King, King Nebuchadnezzar set, sent for the satraps, the prefects and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, and the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come and assemble and come to the dedication of the statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So the satraps, the prefects and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces assembled for the dedication of the statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. When they were standing before the statue that Nebuchadnezzar had set up, the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, and entire musical ensemble, you are to fall down and worship the golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship shall be immediately thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, and entire musical ensemble, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshiped 
the golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Accordingly, at this time, certain Chaldeans came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, and entire musical ensemble shall fall down and worship the golden statue. And whoever does not fall down and worship the golden statue shall be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. There are certain Jews whom, whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshrach, and Abednego. These men pay no heed to you, O king. They do not serve your gods, and they do not worship the golden statue you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshrach, and Abednego be brought in. So they brought those men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods and you do not worship the golden statue that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, an entire musical ensemble, you should fall down and worship the statue that I have made. But if you do not worship, you shall be immediately thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, Mesach, and Abednego answered the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to present a defense to you in this matter. If our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire and out of your hand, O king, let him deliver us. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods and we will not worship the golden statue that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was so filled with rage against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that his face was distorted. He ordered the furnace heated up seven times more than customary and ordered some of the strongest guards in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to throw them into the furnace of blazing fire. So the men were bound, still wearing their tunics, their trousers, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the furnace of blazing fire. Because the king's command was urgent and the furnace was so overheated, the raging flames killed the men who lifted Shadrach, Mesach, and Abednego. But the three men, Shadrach, Mesach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the furnace of blazing fire. Then King, Abu, then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up quickly. He said to his counselors, was it not three men that we threw bound into the fire? They answered the king, true, O king. He replied, but I see four men unbound, walking in the middle of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the fourth has the appearance of a god. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the door of the blazing fire and said, Shadrach, Mesach, and Abednego, Servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Mesach, and Abednego came out from the fire. And the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads was not singed, their tunics were not scorched, and not even the smell of fire came from them. From them. 
Nebuchadnezzar said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. They disobeyed the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree. Any people, nation, or language that utters blasphemy against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their houses laid in ruins. For there is no other God who is able to deliver in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. May the Spirit bless us with wisdom and wonder as we ponder the meaning of these words for our lives. I'll tell you, these, these readings, right? And you wonder why these are the lesser known characters in the Bible. <laughs> I, I, I hear, uh, rumor has it that there's now a competition for who can read the story with more fervor, right? Okay, so um, just a word. I am going to pronounce things a bit differently than Jeff did. Just like last week, I pronounced things a little differently than Sharon did. But, you know, you'll be able to follow along because you're, you're smart and wise people, aren't you? Okay, here we go. When J.K. Rowling published the seventh book in her Harry Potter series back in 2007, like many other people, I rushed out and bought a copy of the book fresh off the press, and then I stayed up far too many nights in a row and devoured the, other, the entire thing until I had finished it, reading those concluding chapters of Rowling's story of good versus evil, which culminated in the Battle of Hogwarts, in which the Dark Lord, Lord Voldemort, was slain once and for all. Now, you might think that I, who see myself as someone who stands on the side of good, would have been giddy with excitement as I was you know, reading through those pages about the final battle scene as it unfolded. But instead, I actually sobbed my way through the end of the book, those last chapters of Rowling's epic story. And I sobbed because some of my favorite characters in the series became casualties of that final battle. I think we're so far beyond spoiler alerts with those books and all the movies that, you know, Fred Weasley and Lavender Brown, people who were near and dear to me, lost their lives in the end of that series. It was an all too poignant reminder to me that in the struggles of good versus evil, rarely, if ever, does, en- do, does, everyone, does everyone live happily ever after. There are often tragic losses along the way. Now, you might be wondering, what does Harry Potter have to do with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? And I'll admit that this is a very strange way to begin my reflection this morning. But what we have in front of us is actually a pretty strange story. So I'm going to beg your indulgence until I circle back to Harry Potter. Now, although the storyline of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is a bit strange, uh, the story itself, the storyline is pretty straightforward. And uh, Jeff has just done a beautiful job of, uh, of sharing the storyline. Uh, so at the risk of repeating the whole thing, let me just whip through the Cole's notes of what happens in the story. So King Nebuchadnezzar issues this decree Uh, that everyone, all his subjects, are to fall down, to bow down, and worship this golden statue that he has created when they hear the appropriate music played. 
This happens, the subjects bow down, except it turns out that there are some people in the midst who are not doing what has been asked of them. Specifically, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these three Jewish men, are ratted out to the king. They come before the king. The king asks them, you know, is this right that you are not bowing down? They confirm, no, we are not going to bow down to your God. And so they, the king says, then you will be thrown into the fiery furnace. And the king is so enraged that anyone would have the audacity to not follow his command that he actually asks for the, the temperature in the furnace to be cranked up a few more degrees, right? So that the punishment is like really strong. So the men are bound up, they're pitched into the fire. So hot is the fire that the people that do the pitching of them into the fire get burned and lose their lives. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego somehow become unbound or are seen to be unbound walking around in the fire, you know, as if, you know, as if it was, you know, fine for to be in these hotter than, you know, whatever conditions that we are living in or that they were living in. And when King Nebuchadnezzar looks in to see them, to check out, you know, what's happening with these people that he's punishing, he notices that there are no longer three of them in their fire. There's actually four of them walking around in the fire, and one of them looks like they are a godlike creature. So the three men are hauled out of the fire. Nothing, we're not told anything about who hauls them out or what happened to those poor people. And uh, when they come out, there is not a, there is not a, a, um, a trace of soot on their tunics. Their hair has not been singed, and there is not even a wisp of crispy skin in the air. Nebuchadnezzar concludes that surely the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is the most powerful God of all, and a new decree is issued that all must bow down and worship their God. And everyone lived happily ever after, except, of course, the people who had their limbs removed for not following the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What is the moral of the story? The moral of the story surely is, worship the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and you will be saved from all harm. Or is it? Whenever we have a biblical story that's kind of far-fetched, like this morning's story, or one that includes a lot of super, like really supernatural happenings, I always find it helpful to look at the context in which the story is written and the context in which the story is set. In the case of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the story is set during the time of the Babylonian exile. So this is the time uh, between 597 and 538 before the Common Era, so BC, uh, when Israel was taken uh, over by the Babylonians, and all of their nobility, their, their leaders, kind of the, the people who were the ones that were in charge, are taken into captivity in Babylon. And in our story, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, along with Daniel, who is the, actually the protagonist of the book of Daniel, from which this story comes, they are all Jewish nobles. Uh, in the first chapter of the book of Daniel, we hear about the way that they have been brought into the service of the king because of their nobility, because of their wisdom, because of their intelligence. And we hear about how for a period of three years, they are taught the literature and the language of the Babylonians. We hear about how they are also given new names by the king. So when these men had arrived in Babylon, taken out of exile, taken out of Israel into exile, Shadrach's name was Hananiah, meaning 
God is gracious. Meshach's name was Mishael, meaning who is like God. And Abednego's name was Azariah, meaning God keeps them. All of them had names that related to their Jewish faith. Their new names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, all relate in one way or another to the Babylonian gods. So these men, stripped of their previous identities, were slowly being assimilated into their new cultural surroundings. So this is akin to what happened in our own country during the process of colonization, in which indigenous people begin to lose their languages and their cultures and their, their customs. And if you are someone who has immigrated to a new country in your lifetime, or perhaps you are the child of someone who immigrated to a new country, you might be able to relate to the challenge of holding on to your identity, holding on to your language, holding on to your customs in the face of this new land, in the face of the customs and the traditions of the new land. Now, although the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is set during the Babylonian exile, scholars believe that it was actually written down um, much later than that, that it was actually written down during the time of the Greek ruler Antioch, whose persecution of the Jews in Judea and Samaria included outlying all Jewish practices. So we can imagine that when this story was first told, not only did it offer encouragement for people who were trying to hold on to their uh, culture and their cultural and their religious identity during a time of persecution, it reminded them that the God that they believed in was still in control and was somehow still in charge of their destiny at a time when it, I'm sure, felt to them like that was not the case. They were being squashed. And because of that, I think it's really easy to read this story and to think that the miracle in it is the way that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are delivered from the fiery pit, completely unscathed. In the same way that some people think that because Donald Trump dodged a bullet, that he was saved by God in that instance, without any regard for the person and the people who were not saved by the bullets fired on that day, right? So what if the real miracle in this story didn't take place inside the furnace? What if what happened before the men were thrown into the fire is where the triumphant power of God showed up. Isn't the real miracle in this story found in the way that me, these men stand firm in their belief? They stand firm in their trust in the goodness of God and in the ultimate sovereignty of their God no matter what. Isn't it found in their decision to be faithful to their God? regardless of the consequences. They don't know if their God is going to save them from the fire or not. But nevertheless, they, they stand their ground. They stay committed. They don't go into the fire saying, well, you know, you can throw us in there, but we know that our God is going to re rescue us from the pit, so we're not actually that worried. They go into the fire saying, if our God, if, if our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace, great. But if not, we're not going to serve your gods anyway. We will not worship your golden statues. What they do in this moment, then, is they affirm the freedom of the human spirit to choose who and what they are willing to give their allegiance to. That's why they walk around in the fire completely unbound, because they're actually free when they're thrown into the fire. They go into the fire 
in a spirit of freedom because they've made a choice. They've made a significant choice uh, for what they believe in. Even after their identity has been stripped from them and their names changed and their religious practices annihilated, their cultural heritage squashed, their very lives threatened, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they remember who they are. They carry within them the memory of something greater than gold and more powerful than any tyrannical king could ever be. They remember the faith of their ancestors and the promise of the God who brought them out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. They recall the commandments that have been written on their hearts. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And you shall have no other gods before me. The real trial in this story isn't the physical danger that is before Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the possibility that they might get burned or that they might lose their very lives. Our life of faith is never meant to be based in the certainty of our individual bodily deliverance from real and present danger. I'm going to say that again. Our life of faith was never meant to be based in the certainty of our individual bodily, our physical deliverance from real and present danger. The real trial in this story is the spiritual temptation that we all have to deny the power of the divine to give us courage when we need it, to strengthen us when we are weak, to give us faith when we are doubtful. The real temptation in the face of those people and circumstances that test our faith is to forget who we are and to forget what we have to draw on. When all evidence is to the contrary, our faith is meant to be rooted in the choice that we make to stand firm in our belief and a sacred reality beyond ourselves, and in the ultimate goodness of that reality. Which is why I began today with Harry Potter and the casualties that took place on the side of good during the Battle of Hogwarts. Because the truth is that sometimes we are not delivered unscathed from the fiery furnace. Good and faithful people get killed in battles of good and evil. Good and faithful people die from illnesses, from accidents, from being in the wrong place at the wrong time. But one of the promises of the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is that if we do find ourselves thrown into a fiery pit, we will never be alone. All manner of angels and divine beings will accompany us in those places. And perhaps that is especially true if, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the members of Dumbledore's army and Harry Potter, we willingly go into the flames with our trust in the goodness of life and the importance of justice for all firmly before us. In our corner of the world, in our day and age, it's highly unlikely that anyone will stop us, uh, try to stop us from practicing our Christian faith, at least not the version that we practice here. So I can't help but think about some folks who thought that our Christian rights were being trod on during COVID when we weren't allowed to gather in person, right? You'll remember that? That wasn't where we were, but some people do feel that kind of persecution. The assimilation that we are most likely to face is the temptation to give in to the dominant culture of overconsumption, sort of the golden statues of our day, and the social conventions that sometimes do more harm than good. 
when it comes to situations that demand us to choose this day who we will serve, it's highly unlikely that our own lives will be in peril if we make the wrong choice. But the small and the sometimes daily choices we make and the stands that we take on the side of what is good and right, those add up and they can mean freedom or oppression for many, including ourselves. They can mean the freedom or the lack of freedom of our own spirits. So regardless of how we might get burned for the choices that we make or the losses that we might sustain, may we like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have the grace to always remember who we are and perhaps more importantly, to remember the strength and the power of God in whom we put our trust to overcome injustice, to be with us in our trials and in the end to prevail in the name of good. May it be so. Amen. Now we are going to sing a hymn which has a line in about it in it about how we will not be burned. So when we get to that line, I invite you to think about that as your spirit that might not be burned. <laughs> Let's be together in the spirit of prayer. Holy One, we praise you for your deep and abiding love, which sustains each one of us and transforms our lives. We give thanks for the many faces of our faith who have shown us ways of compassion, strength, courage, faithfulness, and justice. Thank you, life-giving God, for inviting us to be your heart and hands and voice in this world. We pray for all the places in the world in the midst of conflict and war. For Ukraine, Russia, Israel, 
Palestine, Yemen, Uganda, Bangladesh, and for the United States. We pray for our country as well. Guide us and our leaders into ways of truth-telling and compassion. O oh God, help us to live responsibly and generously among all the people of this land. Holy One, we thank you for all the countless people who have dedicated themselves to ease the suffering that fills this world. Bless them and empower each of us to find our own ways to create justice and peace out of your love. We pray for those we hold closely in our hearts, for all who are grieving deep losses, for all who need mercy, love, healing. In particular, we pray for Patrick Brown. We pray for John Andrechuk and Andrew Stonkis and Keith Lachlan. In silence, we pray for others now, entrusting them to your great compassion. We offer this prayer in humility and hope, and in the name of our brother Jesus, the one who lights our path to wholeness, justice, and peace. Thank you, God of love and compassion. Thank you for your everlasting love. Amen. The financial offerings that we make for the life and the work of the church are one of the ways that we indicate our commitment. We indicate uh, the priority of, uh, of our faith in our lives. And so uh, with gratitude to those of you who have already made your offerings, uh, we invite further offerings today for the life and work of the church and invite you to touch the plates as they're sent around just to uh, remind yourself of your own commitment and the priority you have in your life of faith.
Let us go now out into this world so full of beauty, so full of trouble. As we go, may everyone that we meet see the face of the living Christ in us, and may we see the face of the living Christ in everyone we meet, this day and always. Amen.